chapter 16. Um, I thought tonight we would, we, we spent, um, I don't know, several weeks talking about, we looked at the places where Paul talks about sin in his epistles, and then um, we looked at how, uh, you know, the answer to that, uh, that Paul gives us, we, we spent some time in Romans, Romans 6, Romans 7, Romans 8. In Romans 6, Paul tells us we're dead to sin, and, and all these things are true because we're in Christ. In Christ, we're dead to sin. In Christ, we're dead to the law, Romans chapter 7. In Christ, we're dead to the flesh, Romans chapter 8. So in Christ, because we're crucified with him and risen with him uh, in our, spiritually, we're dead, dead to sin, dead to the law, and dead to the flesh. And so we spent some time just talking about that and talking about the doctrine of it. And, and last week, spent some time just understanding, you know, how do you, how do you put that into practice? And uh, it, it, it turns out you just have to believe it. Um, Verla talked about how, you know, a book she had read where, you know, that's what, you know, it was written by a lady and she just said, well, you just believe what the Bible says and do it and that's it. And that sounds very simple, but it is the truth of, of what scripture says. It's the word of God that effectually worketh also in you that believe. And we talked about that verse last week quite a bit. And tonight, I thought we'd just take some time, this passage in Romans 16, because beyond just, you know, when we say we just believe what the Bible says, uh, you know, we walk by faith, not by sight, so you just believe it and do it, but it's important to have an, an understanding of of, of what you believe and the context in which you believe. Um, Paul writes here in Romans 16, and it's, it's a real important issue, verse 25, now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. And, and Paul uses a, a term here that is important, and, and that term that is important is there's a, him that is of power to establish you. Um, Paul's desire for the church at Rome was that they be established in the faith. That is, that to be able to stand in the faith. And, and one of the things that, that is a problem when we say, well, you just, you just you know, read the verses, Understand, you know, understand the verses and just do them. Well, that's all well and good, but uh, it's very important that we understand there's a process of coming to understand God's word to be established in that word. You can't take someone that just has no concept of of the word of God and what it is and and how it works and and, and how each verse relates to each other verse and just say well here's a verse just do it because then what you end up with then is you know the old thing of well I what does God want me to do and I think this is what he wants me to do I'm going to believe that verse but that's not it's a little more than that it's more than just picking a random verse and you know the old joke is, you know, uh, God, what do you want me to do? And the guy points at the verse, and it says Judas went on and hung himself. And he says, well, that's no good. And then he, so he said, I'm going to try again. So he flips over and points to a verse, and that verse says, everybody know this joke, but go and do that likewise. Yeah. So that's not that's not the way you want to study the Bible. You need to be established, and and this establishment, we've talked about this in the past. This establishment is important. Um, as a process, because there are times in your life when things are going well. And when things are going well in your life, that's the time when you can take in information, process information, understand information, think through information, and, and become established in the faith. The time to to figure out or understand God and understand what he's doing and understand how he's working is not when you get into a crisis. Because when you're in the middle of a crisis, when the diagnosis is cancer, or when the hurricane washes away the town, or whatever the case might be, that's not the time to say, well, I better, I better start trying to understand God. Because in that moment of crisis, it's very hard, it's very hard to take in new information and process it and understand it and, and become established in it because you need you need a time when you're not facing crisis and you're not 
in an emotional condition and you're not upset and you're not, you need a time, you know, when things are going well that you can become established. The problem is it's kind of counterintuitive for people because when things are going well, generally in, in people's life, when things are going well, are they thinking about God? You know, you, you always hear about the foxhole conversion, right? You know, that's when somebody's never never cared about God, but then they get in a foxhole with the bombs falling around them, and oh my, I better I better call out to God. Well, that's just exactly the opposite of what we need to do. When things are good in our lives, uh, when things are, are calm in our lives and peaceful in our lives, we need to establish ourselves in the faith, establish ourselves in the truth, so that when we face that problem, when we face that difficulty, when we face that crisis, that that undergirding and that that foundation of doctrine is already there so that we can fall back on it because when you're in a crisis and when there's a bad situation you're going to fall back on what has become your habitual action you're not going to learn something new you're going to whatever you habitually do when you face a crisis that's what you're going to fall back on so we need to get those patterns and those habits if you will established it, it, and I just use the word, established before we get to that crisis. And it's interesting, the book of Romans, if you go to Romans chapter 1, uh, and uh, the, the beginning of the, as he, as he addresses the church at Rome, uh, in Romans chapter 1, and uh, look at, at verse, um, bound to us, verse 11. Well, start at verse Verse 9, verse 9, Romans 1, 9. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means, now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift, to the end ye may be, what, established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. So Paul opens the book of Rome. When Paul writes to the church at Rome, he had never been to Rome. You know, by the time you, you know, Rome's written, or you know, Romans is written in, in the middle of the book of Acts, maybe Acts 16, Acts 18 in that area, he writes the, the epistle to the Romans. He doesn't actually get to Rome till the end of the book of Acts, chronologically speaking. You get about Acts 28, he gets to Rome. And, and in that time in between, he writes to the church at Rome, I, I, I've not been there, I haven't seen you, but I long to see you that to the end ye may be established. I want to go there, I want to see you, I want to establish you in the faith. I want to instruct you, I want to impart to you spiritual gift or spiritual truth to the end ye may be established. So what does he do instead? I haven't been able to get there. I haven't been able to come see you. I've been let hitherto from coming to see you. So what does he do? Well, he writes a letter. And the letter that he writes is the book of Romans. And when you go through the book of Romans, you read the book of Romans, the church at Rome reads, reads the opening and says, I, I want to come to see you so that I can establish you in the faith but I haven't been able to come. They read this whole letter and they get to the end and it says, now to him is the power to establish you. And he gives this list and we're going to go through that, that list here tonight and maybe next week uh, and look at exactly what that list means. But the point is, the, the, the book that he writes to establish the church at Rome, we call what? Romans. It's, it's Romans. That's, that's, that's what he writes because I haven't been able to come so I'm going to write you this letter, and when you get to the end, he's a power to establish you. And these things that, that he talks about at the end, we find them all in the book of Romans. We find them other places in, in, in his epistles too. But in the book of Romans, we find all these principles that he says, my gospel, Jesus Christ according to the revelation the mystery, and the scriptures of the prophets. He, he talks about all of them as he comes through the book of Romans. So um, that's why, uh, if you hadn't noticed, Romans is the longest of all of Paul's epistles, um, you know, just by word count, by, by number of pages. It's the longest of all his epistles. It's the one that he covers, you know, maybe the most uh, varied uh, forms of doctrine and truth in that, that epistle because it's being written to do what Paul hadn't been able to go to Rome and do. And do. I want to establish you in the faith. I want to, he, he had done that. If you go back to the book of Acts, 
He had previously done that by actually going to uh, some churches. If you look in Acts chapter 14, he has, uh, in Acts 13, he and Barnabas go out uh, on that first apostolic journey, and he is, uh, they go to, to Derby, to Lystra, to Iconium. We're not going to go through the whole the whole route that he goes, but we know that uh, down in verse um, oh, verse 20, how be it as the disciples stood around, this is when he's stoned at Lystra, uh, he rose up, came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. And you know, we've always talked about what a what an odd thing it is Paul uh, had, had gone, he had started at Antioch, he went to Iconium, he went to Lystra, and then he got stoned at Lystra, probably stoned to death. Then he goes to Derby, and the first thing he does after he, he you know, preaches the gospel at Derby is he goes back to Lystra, then to Iconium, then to Antioch, to the places that had literally, in Lystra they literally killed him, the other places it, that they had thrown him out of the city, um, they had persecuted them all the all the way around, but he went back to each of those places, and he did that for a reason. Verse twenty-two, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and prayed with fasting, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord, on whom they believed. What Paul did in Acts chapter 14 there, he, he went and preached the gospel to these cities uh, and was persecuted greatly for it. But then he went back to those cities and he confirmed the, the, the disciple, co confirming the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith. He established them even to the point where he could ordain elders in every church. There were, were men who were able to be leaders in those churches. They were so grounded and established and confirmed in the faith that they were leaders in those churches. And that's what Paul does in Acts chapter 14. He does it in person in those three cities, four cities, I guess if you count Derby. But then to Rome, he had never been there. He had not gone to that city. He had not preached to that city. He had not established those people in the faith. He had not been able to confirm them. So he writes the book of Romans. And he writes the book of Romans. He said, I, I want to come to establish you. I haven't been able to come to establish you. I'm writing you this letter. And at the end, it's the information in this letter that will establish you in the faith. So we want to talk a little bit about that process of establishment. First, tonight, why is it important to be established? And I've already T touched on that a little bit. It's because you know when 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 a problem or difficulty comes, or you know the context we've been talking about it for the past several weeks is when some temptation to sin comes, when the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life uh, comes. Uh, how do we respond to that? If we if we just if we never thought about it and never considered it and never understood the verses that apply to it before it happens, what's going to happen? You're, you're much more likely to yield to that temptation and to be defeated by it than if you're ready. I, I know what's coming. I mean, the, 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 the number one uh, rule, I guess, in warfare is know your enemy. If you know who the enemy is and you know where the enemy's coming and you know how he's going to attack you, then you can be ready. Israel knows all those Arab nations around them have rockets and, and missiles, and they've got, they've got the Iron Dome. And they, when they come, they're ready for them because they know how their enemy's going to come. And we know how our enemy's going to come when it comes to sin. We know what's going to happen in this life as we face trials and difficulties and, and circumstances. We know all those things, and so we need to be prepared and be established. And that idea of being established, um, it's the establishment that brings comfort. Paul, we, we talked about Romans 1, Romans 16. Paul is writing, he wants to be comforted together. Go back, if you didn't uh, lose it yet, I guess you did. Go back to Romans 1. One of, the, one of the words he uses there, which is a good word uh, for us to understand and a good feeling for us to have, he says in verse um, Verse 12, that is, so, so verse 11, to the end you may be established, 
verse 12, that is, this is Romans 1, 12, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me, that I may be comforted together with you. So there's a, a, a comfort quality of this. If you're prepared and if you're established, then you can have comfort. Those, those you know, um, citizens of Israel, they have a certain level of comfort because they know the Iron Dome is over us. It, it will protect us. Now, that's a, a human invention, and it usually works, but it can fail. We're talking here about the comfort that God's truth can give us, and that's far better than any Iron Dome. We have, you know, we have the truth of God's Word to protect us, to, to equip us to face whatever the circumstances in our life are. So um, it's better, but, but that idea of being comforted is the same. Let's go over to 1 Thessalonians uh, and pick up a couple of these. If you, rem- you recall last week when we looked at the issue of faith, we saw that it was the church at Thessalonica that was an example of, uh, of uh, what it is to walk by faith, while the church at Corinth was much more focused on, you know, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, uh, uh, I'm of Apollos. Uh, they're more focused on uh, taking one another to court, to law, the physical things, the church at Thessalonica, on the other hand, is looking at spiritual things and finding comfort in that. In chapter 3 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 1, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So why did, why did Paul send Timothy to the church at Thessalonica? to establish them, and when you're established, then you are comforted. You can have comfort in that establishment. You can know that you're prepared. On in verse 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. So Timothy's coming to establish you, and once you're established, you will then be comforted. Chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians and verse 11. Uh, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one, one another, even as also ye do. And again, the edification, the establishment in the faith allows you to have comfort. Um, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 16. 2 Thessalonians 2.16. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And and if you see a pattern here developing, that's what I, I hope you see, that establishment, proper establishment, proper edification, proper grounding, proper uh, foundation in the truth allows you to be comforted. You know, we, we, we talk, you know, each Wednesday night about folks that, that have problems and situations, maybe a physical problem or financial problem, whatever the case might be. And, and what, what do we want for them? Well, we want them in those circumstances and situations, if they're not resolved, we at least want them to have comfort. We want them to be established in the face so that they have comfort. So none of these things move me, Paul says. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Uh, we need them to have comfort. We want to have comfort. When we face some trial or difficulty, whether it's some sin that is tempting us or whether it's some circumstance in the flesh in this world, we want to be able to have comfort in that situation. And, and that's, that's what Paul is saying, that establishment will bring is comfort. Um, Go to, uh, let's get Ephesians while we're here. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 13. Ephesians 4 and verse 13. And this runs all through Paul's epistles. We we just looked in Thessalonians, but Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. um, Till we all come, this is speaking of of the completion of God's word and the gifts operating until that point. He says, till we all come in the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the sight of men and cunning craftiness, 
whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body to the edifying of itself in love. So again, we're being edified, we're being built up, uh, we're, we're receiving the doctrine and the truth, the body is edifying itself, and that allows us to live uh, you know, fitly, joined together, compacted by that, which that's, that's that idea of com- we're, we're have comfort in the body of Christ, comfort in the doctrine, comfort in our fellow believers, comfort in that situation that we're in in Christ. We have comfort there. Go back to Romans again, chapter 15 this time. Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, Romans 15, 4. And, and so Paul here is, you know, he's talking about um, things written aforetime, uh, verse, verse 4 of, of Romans 15. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. That we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So Paul's, Paul's message there, the things that were written aforetime, written for our learning, the scriptures are written for our learning, and this, this will become important as we look at chapter 16 at that pattern that he gives there. Those things that were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Again, being established in the faith, being established in the truth, being, being edified in the scriptures brings us comfort. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians 14, excuse me, in verse 3. Uh, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, to exhortation, and comfort. So he's talking here about, about the gifts, you know, about if you speak in, in tongues, uh, it, it's, it, it edifies the, the speaker, not necessarily everybody in the church, but he talks about, uh, you, starting in chapter 14, verse 1, follow after charity, desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye prophesy. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not to men, but to God, for no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification. And so when you have that edification and you have the exhortation, then what does that result in? It results in comfort. So again, comfort is kind of the, the theme you know, of this establishment and edification that then can bring comfort, which is why you know, when we talk about, well, just, just read the verse and believe it, and that is not untrue. That's, that's very true. That's what we have to do. But if we read that verse and we understand that verse in the context of being established in the faith, and of being edified and built up in the faith, then that verse is not foreign to us because it fits with everything else that God has told us. It fits with who we know we are in Christ. It fits with the position he's given us in Christ. It fits with what he's done for us in Christ. And if we can understand it in that context, then it's not so much just, well, read the verse and do it. It's, I read the verse, I understand how that fits with the rest of what what the Bible tells me about who I am in Christ. And then then it makes more logical, if you will, spiritual logic, sense to do that and to act that out. Because it's not just standing alone as, you see this verse? Do it. It's a part of who we are in Christ, and it's a part of the establishment that we have in the faith, and it's a part of understanding how that fits in with who we are in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse 3, 2 Corinthians 1, 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be comforted, uh, though, I'm sorry, that we may comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So God comforts us in our tribulation, and he comforts us in our tribulation, we've already seen, by establishing us in the faith, by being edified in the faith, by being built up in the faith, that gives us comfort. And so God, through his word and through that truth, comforts 
us in our, our tribulation, and, and, and is, that, is that the end? No, he comforts us in our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them that are, which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So when we are comforted by the scriptures, when we are comforted by the edification and the establishment that we have, then, then what are we able to do with that? We're able to comfort others. So, you know, so, someone somewhere, usually even in, in the church, has been through what you're going through. And if they were able to understand the context of how God's word comforted them in that situation, then it's a good opportunity. You know, what, what verses helped you understand what's going on? What concepts, what principles from scripture helped you deal with that? Well, it's this, it's this, it's this. I understood this, I understood that, and it applies. And that's when, when Paul talks in Ephesians 4, we should have probably done these in a different order, but when Paul talks in Ephesians 4 about you know, that which every joint supplieth uh, to the edifying of the body, edifying it, the body edifying itself in love, that's what he's talking about. That's what every joint supplieth. Every one of us is a joint, if you will, in the body of Christ. And that which every joint supplies um, edifies the body and builds it up in love, and allows the body of Christ to comfort itself. You know, Paul um, in, in 1 Corinthians talks about the body of Christ and relates it to our human body. But and and, and what does your human body do to itself? If you, you know, if you get uh, if you're in a baseball game and you get get hit in the arm with the, the ball, what does your body do? What? It tells you that it hurts, but then what does it do? Ooh. Ooh. And what why is why is is this hand hurting? No. But this is hurting. So what does this part of the body do to that part of the body? Oh, yeah. It comforts it. Yeah. Or, you know, oh my back. Whatever the case is, your body is comforting itself. And so if you if you take that analogy on out. You know, when one part of the body of Christ, one member of the body of Christ, one family in the body of Christ, whatever the case might be, is hurting, what do the other parts of the body of Christ do? We comfort. You know, and, 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 and that's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. Now, you know, when you're playing baseball and you get hit with the ball, you never rub it, right? Because that's a real wimpy thing to, to rub it. You're supposed to just, I'm tough. I don't, you know, I don't care. But that's not the way spiritually things work. The body of Christ edifies and comforts itself. So let's go back now to Romans chapter 16. So that's the concept. And, and you know, it ties into what we've been talking about with sin and, and, and uh, the, the, the weapons that we have to fight back against sin and to, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to put off sin in our lives. It, it ties into all of that because, you know, it, it's a part of the establishment process. And because I was thinking about this, you know, we've talked about it the last couple of weeks and, you know, and Verla talked about the book that she had read. And, and um, I was thinking about the how, you know, and I keep thinking, why is it, why is it just, you know, we say, we well, just read the verse, believe the verse and act on the verse. It's simple. Then why is it so hard? And, and I think I was thinking about that. One of the reasons it's so hard is because, Maybe sometimes we try to do that in a vacuum. Maybe sometimes we try to, you know, take a verse and apply it to a situation or circumstance in our life, and we don't really understand the full context of that verse. We're not established in the faith. Now, hopefully, most of us in this room are established in the faith, established in the truth. So, so those verses that we read in a time of distress, we can make good application of them and, and understand them in the proper context and all. But for, for maybe you know, people, believers in general, or even those that, that aren't believers, but just you know, find themselves coming to God's word, you know, the foxhole conversion kind of thing, maybe it's very hard for somebody to just look at that verse, believe that verse, and act on that verse because they have no context or experience or establishment or grounding or edification in how that all works. And so that's what kind of led me to Romans chapter 16 with, become established in the faith. So there's three things, and we're not, uh, we won't 
spend a long, long time on them tonight, but we'll kind of just go through and get the layout of the verse to understand what each one of those things uh, is. Now, the hymns of power to establish you according to my God. So there's three things listed here. And, and we need to look at the punctuation and the, the ands and all to understand what the three things are. Now, the hymns of power to establish you according to my gospel. So there's the, the first, the, the foundation that Paul lays is my gospel. So you call that kind of the foundation stone. Uh, he, he says that first. And then he says, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. So that's the, the second thing. Uh, the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, that mystery was kept secret since the world began, but now it's made manifest. So the, the second thing that Paul talks about is Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. That's the next the, you know, block that you build there. Um, and then, and then the, another and, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. So there's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation. The, I'm sorry. There's a, the, um, yeah, I got to go back one. There is my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and the scriptures of the prophets. So the last thing that's built on that is the scriptures of the prophets. And if you um, look at the book of Romans, that's and, and we'll go next week, we'll get into a lot more passages about this. But if you just look at the book of Romans, that's kind of the way the book of Romans is laid out as you go through the book of Romans. Um, go back to Romans chapter three. So the first issue that, that we need to be established in is my gospel. That is the gospel of the grace of God, the gospel that Paul proclaimed. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 21, uh, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And you go down to verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law the gospel, the grace of God, my gospel. If you want to be established in the faith, and if you want to be ready to face trials and difficulties or face temptation from sin, the first issue that you have to get straight, and it's the first issue that Paul deals with to the church at Rome, is my gospel. You have to know the gospel, the grace of God. You have to understand that... Um, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. You have to understand our justification, our redemption is freely in Christ Jesus. You have to understand that Jesus Christ's blood is a propitiation for sin. And you have to understand that the works of the law are not going to cut it. That it's only the blood of Christ that will provide you with salvation and redemption. That's what Paul calls my gospel, the gospel that he proclaimed. And that's important. As Paul is writing the book of Romans to establish the church at Rome in the faith so that they're prepared to face trials and difficulties, the first thing he says is, be sure you have the gospel clear. And I don't know how many, you know, how many times you know, people come and say, oh, I've got this going on in my life, that going on in my life, what, blah, blah, blah. You talk to them for a while and you find out they're not really completely clear on this. Well, you're never going to, you're never going to get to the point of comfort if you're never clear on this. If you don't know that you know that you know, and you're sure that you're sure that you're sure that you have eternal life in Christ, where's the comfort? How can you have comfort? How can you be comforted? You know, much less when something terrible is going on in your life, how can you have comfort at any time if, you don't, if you're not sure about the gospel, the grace of God, and sure about your redemption and your salvation in Christ? So Paul says to become established, the first thing is my gospel, the gospel, the grace of God. The second thing is Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. If you go to Romans chapter 6, in Romans 6, Paul, and these are the, the, the passages we've looked at just in the past few weeks, so we won't spend a lot of time on them tonight, but this, this issue of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, that is 
Christ as a part of the body of Christ, the head of a body of believers, with us identified with him, united with him. In Romans chapter 6, he, he opens up this discussion by saying, verse, verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Well, how did we get dead to sin? Well, verse 3 says, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So that, and, and you know, it, it starts in Romans 6 with dead to sin, Romans 7, dead to the law, Romans 8, dead to the flesh. But all those things are descriptions of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Jesus Christ, not just as a as a as an a solitary individual, but Jesus Christ as a part of a body of believers. Jesus Christ as the head of a body of believers. Jesus Christ with with people that have been made one with Him, crucified with Him, risen with Him. And so now, when we think of Christ, we think of not just a solitary individual, you know, the King of Israel or the Creator of heaven and earth but we think of him as the head of a body of believers. We're united with him. We're one with him. And, and part of our comfort comes from that fact. We are united with Christ. And in fact, you get to the end of this section of Romans, over to Romans chapter 8. I said it's Romans 6, 7, and 8 where he does this. And when you get to Romans 8, he says this in verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is where? in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we are one with Christ and, and, and Jesus Christ abides in the Father, then can anything separate us from the love of Christ that's in Christ Jesus, our, or the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? It can't. That's understanding Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Christ in intimate identification relationship with a body of believers to such an extent that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Because the love of God is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and can you see how understanding that, even in the midst of trial and tribulation, would give you some measure of comfort? Uh, Paul listed there, who, sh shall, um, who shall separate us from the love of of Christ shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. Um, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, well, death's the worst thing that can happen to you. Can death separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? It can't because we have a relationship with him, Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. So that's the second, you know, how do I get in Christ? How do I become one with him? My gospel. What does that mean to me? What does that give me when I'm one with him? I am one with him. And because of that, I cannot be separated from the love of God because that love of God is in Christ Jesus. I am in Christ Jesus. And that provides me with comfort. And then finally, after you get there, the scriptures of the prophets. And if you go to Romans chapter 9, we've talked about it many times. Romans 9, 10, and 11 is where Paul deals with, well, well, what happened to Israel? What did they do? And all that. And he says down in verse, um, oh, chapter 9, verse uh, 22, what if God, willing to show his wrath and make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted unto destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory to the, unto the, on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared 
unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And, and what's Paul mean there? Well, we've, we've looked at this passage in detail many times. He's saying, what if God, God is willing to show his wrath, he's willing to make his power known, and the whole context here is that's what he was going to do with the Gentiles. He was going to return and, and destroy the Gentiles and establish his kingdom with Israel. And then Paul says, but what if God was will, decided instead to take those vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, the Gentiles, and make them vessels of mercy and show the riches of his mercy on those vessels? And, of course, it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> what if he did? The whole context is, verse 21, hath not the potter power over the clay to the same lump to make one vessel to honor and another to dishonor? What if God decided to take those Gentile vessels of dishonor and wrath and, and show his mercy and his grace to them and make them vessels of the riches of God's mercy? Nay, but who are thou, O man, that replieth against God. Verse 20, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God to the thing formed? Say to him that form it, why art thou made me thus? And understanding the scriptures of prophets is understanding that God, you know, where the Gentiles stood in prophecy as vessels of wrath, and, and God was dealing with Israel and dealing with that chosen nation, now the, the, the Gentiles have become vessels of mercy. And we understand that concept that God is now turn to the Gentiles to make us a part of his body, then we can understand what the scriptures of the prophets are all about. And we can have comfort in the fact that, you know, God took, took the, we who were Gentiles in the old covenant, we were Gentiles in the old Testament, we were Gentiles under the law, we were not a part of God's chosen nation, and he's made us vessels of mercy. And that, you know, it's pretty good when God was so mad that you were a vessel of wrath, and then he said, I think I'm going to make you a vessel of mercy. And then he says, and you got nothing to say about it, oh man, who replieth against God. So all of those things are building an edifice and a, 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 an establishment of doctrine that ends up at comfort. And once you have this whole establishment and this whole foundation built, then when you, you, know, you get, okay, I've got this problem I have to deal with, and you plop a verse on top of that that deals with the certain situation you're in, well, then it makes sense because it's built on all of this, and you just put the icing on the cake, as it were, a verse that deals with the situation I'm in right now. But if you take all of this away and you just pull a verse out and say, well, here's a verse that will help you, well, maybe not so much. That verse needs to be built on these foundations. And we'll talk about a little more next week what, what each of those foundations is and then how you put the verse on top of all of those that deals with whatever you're dealing with. So, does anybody have a question? Yes. You always have a question. I have a question. It's just interesting. You had, been, you had said a couple of weeks ago about your discussions with uh, Dr. Brady about um, he, would all, he would say about being like Christ. Yes. And that the truth is, you want to walk in Christ, not be like Christ. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a friend a friend that I, I had. Uh, he was a Christian psychologist, and we always got into this theological discussion about, you know, you want to be Christ-like. And I would say, no, that's what Satan said. Satan said, I will be like the Most High. And I could never quite get him to understand why to be like Christ is not the issue. It's to walk in Christ to realize that Christ is in us and we in him. It's not just Christ is over here and I want to be like him. It's Christ is in me and I am in him. So I'm walking in him and he in me. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, loved me and gave himself for me. We talked about that verse a couple weeks ago. So, and it is, you know, maybe at first blush, well, yeah, I want to be like Christ. No, I want to walk in Christ. And that's a good distinction to point out. And that, it, it, But you never get there. And the reason Jim Brady couldn't get there was he didn't have this edification built up first. So then that little icing on the top of you're walking in Christ, it didn't, you know, didn't, didn't make sense. So good point, good point. Anything else? All right, let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed and... 
Hope to see you all Sunday morning. Our God and Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that we are in Christ and he in us. We thank you that you've given us a, a pattern of establishment and edification that we can, can uh, walk through and build through so that when we face difficulties, trials, temptations, uh, we, we've got that edifice of doctrine built up in us to allow us to face it uh, and be victorious in it. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.